Well, it's my tremendous pleasure to welcome you to the first uh, annual symposium of the Wheeler Center for Emerging and Neglected Diseases. Uh, I'm Tom Alber. I'm the uh, faculty director of the center. Um, the center called SEND uh, is a coalition of over 60 faculty research groups from 14 departments on campus. And a number of people here today started SEND uh, because the problems of global health are too big for any one research group, as we know. As the world gets smaller, um, there's really no way to ignore the devastation that neglected diseases like HIV, AIDS, uh, TB, malaria, dengue fever, respiratory and infec inf intestinal infections are causing among the world's poorest people. Uh, these are people who lack uh, the resources for science, so it's appropriate that we marshal uh, the resources of our country and our university to solve the, these problems. Um, they're important problems, and we can solve them uh, in the service of global health. So thank you for coming today and being part of this effort. I learned the other day that there are over 100,000 uh, organizations uh, working on solving healthcare problems in Africa. And here we join them, not in Africa, obviously, but uh, it's certainly, in our own unique way, part of the same effort. Um, SAN launched in May, and our goals are to foster innovation, build community, enable outreach, and train students in new ways. Uh, we've had several successes already, including a wonderful exchange program uh, with uh, students from the Indian Institute of Technology uh, at Kharagpur last summer. We have a monthly supergroup research meeting, and we've uh, developed new research partnerships already through SEN. I need to thank some people before we get started today. Uh, Jeff Owen, first and foremost, for all his efforts to get the center going. Uh, Tamina Madden, Maureen Royer, uh, Shail Kumar, Mary Olmsted, and others uh, in LNS for their tireless efforts on our behalf. Um, especially, I need to thank Sam Wheeler. Sam, can you raise your hand here? Um, Sam gave us an incredibly generous gift uh, of $7 million to start the center, and it permanently establishes our center at Cal. Um, in recognition of his gift, we're honored to name the center after him. Um, this is truly a visionary donation. It embodies a spirit of hope that's certainly sweeping our nation and, and now uh, I think the world as a whole. In such a concrete way, uh, Sam's generosity embodies what President-elect Obama said in Chicago just a little while ago. He said, at the end of his speech, he said, this is our time to reclaim the American dream and reaffirm that fundamental truth that out of many, we are one that while we breathe, we hope. And where we are met with cynicism and doubts, and those who tell us that we can't, we will respond with that timeless creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. So and now I'd like to turn it over to Professor Dan Portnoy, the Associate Director of SEND, to introduce today's symposium. Thanks, Tom, and welcome. Um, this meeting which we, is the first of an annual meeting from SEND. Um, was chaired by Russell Vance, and uh, he and I will be the hosts today. Um, it's a pleasure to have, and an honor, to have Reno Rapoli here. Um, and let me tell you just a little bit about um, Reno. First of all, let me say that I think it's safe to say that nobody in the world today, and perhaps ever, has contributed more to the field of vaccinology, certainly in bacterial vaccines. And it's really an impressive um, list of accomplishments. Um, he started in basic biochemistry, and during some subsequent training was working on the biochemistry of diphtheria toxin. And this was the birth of molecular biology and cloning. And very early on, um, Reno appreciated that there were um, specific mutations in diphtheria toxin, which would be fantastic diphtheria vaccines, although there was already a vaccine, but he used these toxins in time and made conjugates to carbohydrates, which was the main challenge in, in, in infants, as they didn't respond to carbohydrates, and now they do, and there's a whole series of vaccines, both uh, 
on the market and in development taking advantage of this te te technology. Um, okay, so uh, another area that he pioneered was immediately within <laughs> incredible short time after the uh, development of genomics uh, in Haemophilus, they used a strategy called reverse genetics, reverse axonology, excuse me, where they would identify potential surface molecules, proteins, and then just test them for their, uh, their efficiency in generating appropriate immune responses. And this has been extremely effective as well. Along the way, they developed a new adjuvant, and they're using this adjuvant for influenza vaccines. So it's a really impressive list. Um, Reno is now um, the head of vac global vaccine development at Novartis and, a, and has started a new institute uh, or research group in neglected diseases that's also associated with Novartis and is present um, in Siena, where uh, Reno is headquartered, along with the Novartis group that he's building rapidly in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So today we're going to hear about recent uh, advances in, in, in vaccine development, and I'm really, really glad that you came today, and uh, thank you very much for being here. Well, th thank you, Dennis. It's, it's a really a great pleasure to be here today, um, and to talk about the I mean, what vaccines mean for today's society, for the science, but also uh, the most important thing, how do they fit in the modern medicine into the society of the 21st century? So the, if I fail to deliver the message, uh, the, the entire thing I want to say is in this slide. And basically, <sighs> throughout my talk, I will try to share with you my experiences in, in vaccines, why we believe vaccines are important, why it have been important in the past. And uh, many people say, well, now we, we conquered most of the kids' disease, so do we need vaccines for the future? And what, I'm trying to, what I try to say is that vaccines are probably one of the most important things that can ensure high quality of life, the population of the future. And they can go far beyond the infants and, and the children, can reach any age. Um, globally. And so technology, economics, everything is going to a direction. However, while the vaccines with the new technologies are really uh, railing in the 21st century, the mindset of most of the people that think about vaccines is still in the past century. So there is um, most of the people, policymakers, but even pediatricians, scientists, and things like that, still believe of vaccines like uh, they did a century ago, or maybe 20 years ago. And unless we reconcile those two things, it will be difficult to bring together uh, all the benefits that vaccines can do. So the, I'll start with a little introduction about uh, quality of life and life expectancy. This is a slide that I took from a paper in PNAS a couple of years ago that basically looked at the life expectancy in four European countries, starting from 1750 to 1900. And during that period, basically, life expectancy in Europe went from 35 years to approximately 50 years. And today, obviously, it's gone up. It's gone up. And they asked the question, what was the reason for the life, the increase in life expectancy during that year. And they came down with this conclusion. Basically, they came down to the conclusion that, that the increase in life expectancy during that period in those European countries was due to the conquest of infectious diseases. And they uh, basically put forward two reasons. One that was already very well known, that if you <clears throat> basically eliminate infectious diseases, you decrease inf infant mortality. So if you have two guys, one dies at two months and the other one dies at 70, average, li average li life expectancy is 35. So that's fine. But what's the innovation that came out of the paper is this part. Basically, they saw that the people that were anyway surviving the initial uh, 
infant mortality, they will live longer if they had less infectious diseases when they were young. And the hypothesis they put forward is basically the infectious diseases in early age starts a number of inflammatory processes that basically use up the immune system, your body, your things, so that if you had all these infectious diseases when you get the later age, basically your body is, is older than should be, and <coughs> people don't, don't live that long. So basically, the, this part has become a very important part of, of their discussion. <coughs> so the, <coughs> obviously, there are many reasons why we have been able to conquer a lot of infectious diseases, but perhaps, and the most important thing has been the uh, vaccination. And vaccination, really the first really sustainable, if you like, uh, <coughs> revolution that allowed to conquer infectious disease was vaccination. That started with Pasteur. And vaccination is, has been, and probably still is, for most of the vaccines which are licensed, a very empiric approach. With all the vaccines that we have in the market today, are basically have been developed using the very basic principles of Pasteur. And Pasteur said, if you want to make a vaccine, basically you need to isolate, inactivate, and inject the microorganism that causes the disease. And what you need to do, I mean, following this, basically is you can develop killed vaccines. Uh, today we do VLPs, which are a modern version of killed vaccines. Live attenuated vaccines. Uh, today we do some vectors, not repl replicating or replicating a version of those, or subunit vaccines. But basically, all the vaccines that have been developed so far have been based on empirical approach, which is, follows these, these principles. And uh, thanks to the vaccines and other health interventions, today uh, life expectancy uh, has grown, uh, as, and now we, we are beyond 80 years of age in general. And <clears throat> it's interesting that there has been, in 1980s, people thought that the UN estimated that 80 years will be the maximum that mankind can achieve. And then a year, 10 years late, five years late, 10 years later, they had to revise the thing because people were living longer. And that now uh, uh, even living, people are even living longer than the latest estimates of 1990. So that's uh, great news for people like me that are approaching that age. Uh, and uh, it's a bad news for our entire healthcare system that is collapsing because the uh, global uh, population is aging. So that calls uh, for a new model for healthcare because the just curing people uh, once they get sick is not going to be enough uh, to uh, maintain a good quality of life for people. So I think and here is where vaccines can contribute. How can they do that? I think what could they, so far vaccines have been basically mostly uh, up, uh, approaching the infant diseases and they've been very successful. Now, we see that with human papilloma virus vaccine, we are trying to uh, uh, vaccinate the adolescents. Uh, with, we are try, uh, trying to uh, approach the elderly with influenza. But basically, what I see is that all these uh, different ages will have their optimal vaccines and try, will try to prevent diseases uh, <coughs> and keep people healthy throughout their entire life by vaccination. So the vaccines were still 90% used for infants. I think in this century, they will develop and will expand to approach the entire human population, uh, the older ages of human population. Now, it's actually true that life expectancy is uh, <coughs> really re related to the, uh, to the conquest of infectious diseases. It is. This is an example of Africa today. Uh, in Africa, like in all the other countries, life expectancy was going up, up to the 80s. Then HIV came, 
an infectious disease, and basically, life expectancy went down to pre-1950s. So it, it is, what one single infectious disease can really uh, be uh, really uh, uh, so uh, influential in life expectancy of the people glo globally. Another slide that, to address the same thing is this one. This slide, many people may have seen this. This slide has been used, uh, is used very frequently to show that uh, this is life expectancy in the United States from 1900 to 2000. And uh, started approximately 47, 48 years and went down to approximately 78 years. And what you see here is that a peak, which has been due to the uh, pandemic influenza in 1918. So here you see why how a single infectious disease can really uh, decrease life expectancy by more than a decade within a very short period of time. Now, one thing which is in this slide that many people don't uh, really take into account is, for instance, this slide you have the decrease in life expectancy of World War I and World War II, which are believed to be the most tragic, dramatic things of the past century. Well, if you look at them, if you sum the two worlds, you don't got even close to what one single infectious disease has done. And that's the thing, I mean, the proportion that one should use when it thinks about infectious diseases and prevention. Then. That's what they can do. The, then the other example I want to give is, is uh, I come from Siena in Italy where uh, <clears throat> basically, it, which, which was a very powerful economy in the Middle Age, in the 1300, was one of the richest uh, European cities. Uh, and they, at that, today we do tall buildings, skyscrapers. At that time, if you were powerful, you will, instead of the tallest building, you wanted to build the largest cathedral. So they started to build what was the largest cathedral worldwide at that time. They started to build it. And they reached a point, this point, this was supposed to be the main facade of the cathedral. And then in the spring, May 1348, the Black Death, the plague, arrived. And in three months, only three months, killed 75% of the people. And basically, in three months, the entire economy went down. Most of the people were dead. They lost the know-how. They didn't know. They lost the painters, the architects, the people knew how to build the cathedral. So they lost everything. And the cathedral, this wall is ever, has been there for now 700 years. And I call this the largest monument to infectious disease has ever been uh, uh, built. Uh, it's a reminder that really infectious diseases can not only kill people, but they can destroy economies, and they can uh, destroy know-how, they can de destroy everything. And after this introduction, obviously, yes, vaccines are the very effective in uh, basically preventing infectious diseases. Here are the list of the uh, <clears throat> 10 most uh, important vaccines that our kids get. And the, the amazing thing is they do reduce uh, the mortality due to the disease by 97, 98, 99 percent. In fact, if you look at all the successful medical interventions that have been developed during the last 40, 50 years, <clears throat> basically <clears throat> the therapeutic interventions are very successful, and, but in the best case, they reduce by 75%, 67, 60, 40% mortality. Vaccines, when they are successful, they reduce by 97%. So, Vaccination is always by far the best solution when you have a vaccine. Now, <clears throat> what's the problem with vaccines? Well, vaccines, have, the main problem with them has been, has been that they've been developed following the principle of Pasteur. They've been developed a lot in the beginning of the first part of the last century. Um, and they were very often very crude preparation. So they're very successful. Very nice, but they had some uh, effects, some uh, side effects, uh, or some safety concerns that people were very concerned about. Example was smallpox. Smallpox has been 
probably the greatest vaccines, vaccine ever developed, eradicated from the, from the planet one in, deadly infectious virus, but the vaccine itself was pretty dangerous. And people will get encephalitis, we, we get, <coughs> myo, now we, we discover myocarditis, a lot of fever, a lot of things. So people were scared uh, about getting the smallpox vaccine. Even the most, one of the most successful vaccines, the Sabine oral polio, which has been <coughs> instrumentally eradicating uh, almost completely uh, poliomyelitis from, from um, uh, the globe, is basically had side effects. Uh, and in one case, every three million, basically, instead of preventing the disease, will cause the disease. So there were safety concerns with these things. And then there are other examples. Measles in high doses was a problem. In the 80s, in this country especially, there was a lot of concern about old cell pertussis. Uh, the rotavirus uh, got into susception, and so on. And there are some things which are not real, like tamerosol, uh, but they've been perceived as a problem uh, by, because they've been linked by autism, to autism and other things. So unfortunately, due to these things, vaccines, uh, in the mind of people, vaccines are associated with a risk. Now, the fact is that in today, basically, the, all these diseases, all these vaccines that used to have problems, they are all being discontinued, at least in the Western world. So all these things are gone. Even thimerosal, it was not a problem, but was perceived as a problem. We don't use it any longer. So basically, we are in the world where vaccines are much safer, and the new vaccines are even safer because we use new technologies, new things. But people always associate vaccination with the risk. So if I look at the way vaccines should move, it's basically in the past century, or even 1980s, vaccines were perceived as great because they've done a lot to mankind, but dangerous because there was a risk. And, and I gave you the example. I think today we should be in the position to say vaccines are just great because those risks are gone. But that, this concept has not yet penetrated the people. The mindset is still here. So that people still perceive vaccines as a danger. And this is, you can see it very easily when people say, well, there is autism, must be vaccines, because vaccine. So people don't ask whether it's a, they just make the association. So basically, uh, I believe that we should change, probably should change name to, vaccinate, to vaccines, because uh, I mean, the mindset of people, people vaccines mean, means risk. So we should change probably name, or at least should educate people that that risk is gone. That's why I believe that people should think to vaccination, not anymore as a risky but useful thing, but as a kind of when you get vaccinated, you take your insurance against the risk, which is the infectious disease. So I think it's a mindset that we should change. Otherwise, we're still gonna be with uh, people that any, anything's gonna come up is gonna be due to vaccination because uh, vaccines are, uh, are perceived as a risk. So if I have to sum up my experience in the last 30 years I've been in vaccines, I think when I started in 1980, I took all that dark age of vaccinology. Basically, the scientifically were not very attractive. It was very empirical approaches. Economically, they were a disaster. People did not want to invest in them. And today, basically, I call the golden age of vaccines because uh, the, the technology is really, and we'll give you examples, so provide a lot of opportunities which were never there before. Uh, the business makes sense. People invest in vaccines. We've gone from the Pasteur principle of empiricism to the possibility of designing vaccines. Uh, so it's intellectually, they're very attractive. And I think, as, as I said, we can move from great but dangerous to great life insurance uh, <coughs> against a uh, risk of infection. So let me talk a little bit about the kind of rev uh, revolutions in technologies that allowed us to move forward with vaccines. Uh, up to 1980, basically, 
the empirical approach of Louis Pasteur was basically the only way to do vaccines. Then there have been several ways of, of uh, evolution. The first one was glycoconjugation. The second one was uh, genomics. And the next wave, which I think is about to come, I don't know exactly when, but it's, can feel it's coming, is when <coughs> we, we're gonna move into new uh, uh, areas that have not been able to conquer yet. So I'll go, I'll make a few examples. The first one will be uh, the conjugation, then I'll go into reverse vaccinology. The example is gonna use is going to be the field that been, I've been working with uh, the last 20 years, which has been uh, meningococcus. Basically, meningococcus caused by a gram-negative bacterium is capsulated, and based on chemical composition, the capsule is divided into several groups, A, B, C, and Y, and is a deadly disease. There are not many cases, but when it happens, it's really uh, <coughs> uh, terrible, because typical example of, uh, uh, of a meningococcal disease is when you, you have a young boy or girl that basically is playing uh, soccer or football or whatever in the afternoon and is perfectly healthy by six o'clock, goes home, maybe has a headache, and by 10 p.m. can be dying in an intensive care unit. So when that happens, it really attacks healthy people, healthy young kids, uh, up to from newborns to 25, 30 years, and it's always dramatic because the kids are very healthy up to a few hours before, and then is is very is very fast disease. And what happens? You have a lot of that, still 10, 15 percent mortality in spite of the uh, great healthcare systems that we have, and in, and or severe disability, amputation of legs, arms and or other things, which is still happen in 20, 25% of the cases. So it's really a dramatic disease. And vaccination um, was known to be possible by using the capsular polysaccharides of these bacteria that we here are shown as long chains of sugars that basically, that, that are the chemical composition of which is different, the five serogroups. And it was known uh, since uh, the 60s, that if you could pure, the, the polysaccharides were good vaccine antigens. So if you had antibodies to the polysaccharides, you will be, would not get disease. Uh, vaccines were developed using the polysaccharides, but they did not work that well. And they worked only in uh, adolescents and adults, but they did not work in infants. And the reason is that the polysaccharides are not able to interact with the T cells so that they couldn't get help and in, <coughs> it basically didn't work. So the, the revolution, if you like, came in the late 80s when it became possible to basically take the polysaccharide, uh, which have excellent B cell epitopes, link them in a covalent manner to a protein, which provided T cell epitopes. And now the, this new vac vaccine, for this, va this vaccine doesn't work at all in infants, really zero response. This one works beautifully, 100% response. This, and so uh, in the early 90s, I developed the first conjugate for meningococcus C. And then we worked in collaboration with the uh, United Kingdom public health system to develop a vaccine against meningococcus C in the United Kingdom. Um, the, <coughs> they wanted to get rid of this meningococcus C, and so they decided to vaccinate every single person in the United Kingdom from two months, two months of age to 18 years of age. In one year, vaccinated everybody. And where three companies developed this vaccine in partnership with the, US, with the UK government. And I like to show this slide over and over again because it's a good example of how vaccines can be really effective. Here you see the weeks of a year. And here you see number of cases of meningococcal meningitis, one of the cohorts that uh, we vaccinate. In red, you see the, num the cases the year before we, we, we introduced the vaccine. Basically, every single week with a peak in the winter uh, were new cases added and people were dying, people had permanent sequelae. A year later, the cases in yellow were higher or at the beginning of the year than the previous year. Then we started vaccination, the, the, basically the cases plateaued. Next year, 
the cases were gone. Here were 1,500 kids in the UK getting meningococcal disease every year, more than 150 dying every year, 350, 400 permanent sequelae, gone. Gone with the one year intervention. So this is a, one of the slides I'm most proud of because it really showed that when you really make a good vaccine, things can really happen. Now this vaccine has been introduced in many parts of the world. And uh, following this example, there are vaccines against four of the five meningococcal serogroups that have been developed. And they are actually uh, licensed or, or uh, about to be licensed in, worldwide. So I think using the conjugate technology, we been able to solve uh, part of the, uh, at least four of the five serotypes of meningococcus. There is one serotype, however, which is B, which we could not solve with this approach. And the reason is that this serotype is, uh, has a peculiar composition of the, poly, of the capsular polysaccharide. The composition is a polysialic acid linked alpha 28, which is identical in structure to a polysialic acid, which is in our glycoproteins. For instance, NCAM has a long chain of polysialic acid. So this guy basically has taken one of our tissues and has coated itself with one of our tissues. So this antigen is a self-antigen for us. So we cannot mount an immune response. We are tolerant. So this appro the approach of conjugates has been tested, but didn't work. And so people have been trying to solve the meningococcus B problem uh, in many different ways. So in the 80s, tried conjugates, didn't work. Uh, in the 90s, we tried uh, outer membrane vesicle vaccines, didn't work. Purified proteins did not work. Uh, <clears throat> the best vaccine that came out was an uh, outer membrane vesicle vaccine, which is, um, was a failure, but was a proof of concept that the vaccines can work. These outer membrane vesicle vaccines are basically very crude preparation. You take the bacteria, you add the detergent, and you extract vesicles of the outer membrane. You semi-purify them, you use them as a vaccine. These things are induce protective antibodies, but unfortunately, they induce protective antibodies only against the strain that you use for, uh, to make the vaccine, not against many other strains. So what happened was that there are cases where you can use it. For instance, in New Zealand, at the beginning of the 1990s, an epidemic of meningococcus B started, and that epidemic was clonal, was due to a single strain, more or less. And so in, shortly after we had done the intervention in the United Kingdom, we made an agreement with the New Zealand government to develop a vaccine uh, or made by automembrane vesicles derived from the, the strain that was causing the, the disease in New Zealand. And we did a similar approach to United Kingdom. We vaccinate every single uh, uh, person from two months to 18 years of age. Here are the cases before we introduced the vaccine. Here was a year later. Again, we have been able to eliminate a terrible pandemic in New Zealand. To give you an idea, it was not, not a single family which had not a child or, or a relative had been hit by the disease. This is gone, and it's gone very quickly. The, the problem has been that this vaccine is great in New Zealand, but because cover 80% of the cases. But if you bring this vaccine to USA or Europe, we'll probably cover 10, 5% of the cases because here the disease is endemic and there are many other strains. So in the middle of the 90s, basically I got to the point where I was pretty convinced that the conventional approach to make vaccines, the Pasteur principle of vaccinology, was not going to help us to solve the meningococcus B. So basically, I ran out of ideas how to do it. And um, I don't know what you do here when you run out of ideas. And there are a lot of beautiful things you, you can do in, in the Bay Area. I can think a lot of them. But I live in, I live in Siena, at least uh, uh, I come from there. And in Siena, there is, um, in addition to the cathedral and the monument to infectious disease I told you before, there is a a beautiful place called Piazza del Campo. Uh, uh, if you've seen the latest movie of James Bond, it starts exactly there. And, 
and there's a, a nice, uh, nice place. And so, so it's pretty relaxing. So in Siena, when you, if you run out of the ideas, you go down to Piazza del Campo, sit down, get a glass of wine, and wait for better ideas. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so and you can have many of these sessions. You know, it's, it's not a, so basically, the, the next ideas came when Craig Venter published the genome of, of Haemophilus influenza. It was a new technology, new information. We said, well, maybe this new information can be useful to tackle a problem they couldn't tackle with the, techno with the technology available at the moment. So I um, went to visit Craig Venter. We, we agreed that he would sequence the genome of meningococcus B for us. And we started an approach which was basically we call reverse vaccinology because it was based on genetics, but also the path to vaccine discovery was completely different from what had been up to the moment. Up to the moment, we always started from the pathogen. You grow the pathogen, you do something, you cook it, you do something, and finally you inject it and you have a vaccine. Here we are starting from, not from the, the microbiology lab, we are starting from the information was on the computer. And we're trying to design backwards a vaccine. And now this is history, but basically uh, we predicted 600 antigens, the potentially good candidates. We made, we expressed 350, we tested in mice more than 340. And very quickly we got to the point where we realized that we had a new powerful technology in our hand. And the, that came when really not many months after we started the project, we had discovered 91 novel surface-exposed proteins of meningococcus. I said, why is 91 so interesting? It was so interesting because the entire scientific community working not only meningococcus, but all the other Neisseria, in the, up to that point, in more than a century, had discovered up to 12, maybe 15 proteins which were surface-exposed. That was the entire knowledge. And now, in a few months, we got 90. And so clearly, we had a lot of unknown things to discover. And the interesting thing was that some of them were good vaccine antigens. So we, we did this process very quickly, 18 months, to discover 28 potential vaccine candidates. Then, and this part was very fast. Then we had to say which one of these we put in the vaccine. So that was slow, tremendously slow. That took two years, really, just to prioritize and decide which one we're going to put. But eventually, we got a vaccine that uh, we adjuvanted with a basic adjuvant like alum. And when we tested with a panel of strain collected globally, basically, it was able to cover up 78% of the, of the strains. The OMV vaccines down here with the same panel, they did not cover more than 20%. And then uh, we saw that if you added more potent adjuvant, like CPG, mf 59 or Freund adjuvant, basically the coverage of this vaccine could go to 95 or 97%. So basically the vaccine composition itself was covering every single strain worldwide. The problem was uh, that needed probably a stronger adjuvant to go beyond 80%. This vaccine today is, uh, has gone to, from mice to phase one to phase two in infants, and is now in phase three in infants in Europe. And uh, the results of the phase twos are very good, were reported uh, in the spring. Basically, we get good coverage against three strains which are in, uh, somehow representative of the diversity. And, you get after three immunization, we get very good response, goes down a little bit in one year, they will give a boost, we get 200%. So basically this vaccine now is in phase three and hopefully will become available in the next few years. But this is an example of how using a technology, which is genomics, you can actually solve a problem. The interesting thing is that in addition to solving a problem, we also have a fun. Because we discover new things which are totally, were totally unknown to the biology before. I'll give you only one example. In the case of meningococcus, <clears throat> people have been trying to develop animal models for forever, and just they don't work. I mean, you can try, but 
uh, but they, the, the bacteria just doesn't grow in the blood of animals. Um, now, one of the antigens that we discovered uh, <coughs> was found by other people, started, we published, other people started to work on, on it, and two independent labs published a year ago that this antigen actually is, binds human complement factor H. Now, when I learned that, I didn't know what human complement factor H was. In the meantime, I learned that the human complement factor H is a, a protein which is a, in our blood and is present in massive quantities. And basically, it, it coats all our tissues, our cells, our endothelium, to make sure that the C3 component of the complement, which is called the fuel of the complement, doesn't attack our tissues and doesn't melt down our, our blood vessel. So this bacterium, what it does through this protein, basically it is, it coats itself with this protein, with complement factor H, so it becomes a, like a self-tissue for, for the complement, so it's not, uh, it's not killed by the human blood. <coughs> so the interesting thing is that this protein only binds human factor H, doesn't bind uh, macaque, doesn't bind uh, rat, mouse, rabbit, and so on. So that's why people have never been able to, uh, to grow this bacteria in animal models. I mean, it's not, it's not evolved to, to grow in their blood, it's evolved to, to grow in only in the human blood. Now, knowing this, you can put human, recombinant human uh, factor H into uh, mice or, and rats, and now you can get the bacterium growing. So, I mean, we learned part of the biology. And another thing which I think was, uh, uh, I don't have a slide here, but I think it's worth mentioning that we had applied this uh, uh, rever reverse vaccinology approach to many bacteria. And streptococci have been some of those. And <coughs> there we did the same thing. We did try to identify uh, a lot of um, uh, vaccine candidates. We find some which were, in the case of group E streptococcus, they were very protective. We didn't know anything about that. And then what their biology was. We just knew they were protective in the animal models. And then uh, Pete Lauer was on the, the audience, basically started to say, well, what is this new protective antigen? And he discovered the new protective antigen was a, a pillus. Uh, and the fact was that up to that moment, people did not, I mean, the old literature said that gram positives did not have pili. Uh, although pili are longer uh, than the bacteria themselves. So basically, it's an approach where you not only uh, develop vac new vaccines, but really you learn about biology. The, today, I mean, we start with the genome. Today, we use the transcriptome, the protein, the sulfur, the immunome, everything. Uh, obviously, you inter try to integrate all these things to get the things done. But the lesson is that the target of vaccines or licensed vaccines, which was here, now is expanding, and we can tackle the rest of the pyramid. And so basically, there are very few limits to develop vaccines today. So for instance, I mean, approaches have been done to a lot of bacteria. Uh, and you know, we talk a lot about today about uh, antibiotic resistance. Yes, you can develop vaccines against antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria. And I think that's the only solution we have for them. There is no resistance to vaccines. Cancer, there, been, there are already vaccines against cancer. Others are in development. And others probably we, 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 <coughs> we can start to work on. So basically, the, there is a lot of uh, new, uh, I mean, we can develop new vaccines against a lot, lot of things. In this slide, what I wanted to do to do is basically summarize what I've been, I think I've been learning the last 30 years of doing vaccines. And basically, I tried to put two things, uh, two variables. One is the antigen variability, which can be one day, one year, 10 years, that each pathogen can have. And the type of immunity can be T cells, antibodies, or a mix mucosal B and T cells. And if you put, if you do this graph, you put diphtheria up there, 
And basically, no change in antigen variability and antibodies are sufficient. And a vaccine for this was ready in 1920s. And HIV is down here, uh, where basically there is no solution today. If you look at the licensed vaccines today, they are all up there. They are against, they're mostly work through antibodies, and they work against uh, pathogens. They have antigens that either do not change or change not too much. Now, what the reverse vaccinology does gives you the approach to basically to expand to all this area. Because now, instead of having few antigens to look for, you basically have an entire repertoire of each pathogen. So you can look for those antigens which are, uh, don't change too much, and they are target of antibodies. So basically, here, there's getting new vaccines done is just a question of doing a lot of work, systematic work. But you can do that. There is an area, which is down here, where even with the technology today, we, we don't know, we, we cannot solve these problems. And I think this is a, we need a paradigm shift in science. We have, there is a gap in science that we don't know how to uh, do cancer vaccines, uh, therapeutic cancer vaccines. We don't know how to approach HIV. But even there, the technology, the knowledge is moving so rapidly that I think we're, we will get soon in the position to uh, do this. The three things that I think are important is what I call structural vaccinology, do a lot of 3D structure of antigens, protective, non-protective, immunodominant, non-immunodominant, so that you can actually learn which are the rules behind the structure of an antigen interacts with the immune system. Novel adjuvants, very important, and the science here, the immunology has moved tremendously. Uh, the ability to program the immune system that we can start to do. So I think there's a lot of science that's moving here, and I think we will bridge this gap pretty soon. Um, another gap in vaccine development is, uh, is not scientific, but it's really structural. The, today, up to today, really, there is no mechanism in place to the level of vaccine developing for develop, that are needed in developing countries. The reason is that there is no market, and uh, no market, the companies don't work on them. If companies don't work on them, vaccines don't get developed. So basically, uh, that's been one of my frustrations for many years, because uh, working in a company, you cannot do this thing. So I'm pretty proud that uh, in a year ago, basically we started a new institute, which is called Novartis Vaccine Institute for Global Health, which is a non-profit, uh, but has basically access to all the technology know-how we have in the vaccine company, and uses all this to basically to develop vaccines against neglected diseases. And this is up and running now, is actually doing very well the first year of life. And so I hope this is a way, uh, <coughs> basically this institute is not doing discovery. I mean, it wants to partner with universities, uh, academia, uh, scientists that do the discoveries. This institute is able to translate quickly a discovery into a product. So hopefully we'll find a lot of ways to interact with, uh, with people who have a similar mission. Um, the last few slides I want to show you is, uh, today we talk a lot about pandemic influenza, this kind of thing. I want to show you the results of um, uh, <coughs> some trials that we, we have done, and which, I, from my point of view, provide a final solution uh, to pandemic influenza. The solution, uh, I think, is that is, again, I, I see vaccination, uh, in this case, as basically, if you get vaccinated today, you take your insurance, get a risk, which is pandemic influenza. Um, the, the trial has been developed like this. Back in 1997, when the first H5N1 uh, virus appeared in Hong Kong, we developed a, a vaccine before reverse genetics uh, using a duck strain H5N3, and we vaccinated people in 1999. Then, a year ago, we went back to fund 30 of the same people, and we gave them a new vaccine, now a different clay, different virus. And this slide basically summarizes what we have seen in this period. 
The first thing that we saw in 1999 is basically we vaccinated people with the vaccine and this is the protective level. So the vaccine alone was not protected. Today, that has been repeated by many publications that now are in New England Journal of Medicine and other things. We published this in Lancet in 2001, but people forgot. The, <clears throat> the same paper we published that instead of using the vaccine alone, we're using an adjuvant, MF59, which is an oil water emulsion that we had just licensed in Europe. Now, after two doses, you could get uh, um, most of the people with protective level of antibodies. So that was a good uh, discovery. We're very proud of it. In the meantime, the, this thing has been repeated by many other trials. They have shown that without, a, without this, without adjuvant, you don't get it. With an adjuvant, you get it. And usually, this curve is blown up within the entire thing, so you're very proud that you reached this level. But <clears throat> then, as I said, uh, six, eight years later, basically, we went back to the same people and we gave them two doses. These people have been vaccinated with a, uh, what today is called clade zero, the first one uh, in Hong Kong. Now we gave them clade one, a different virus uh, isolated in, 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 in Vietnam in 2004. And we gave them two doses, but what we saw is that after the first dose, basically we got titles which were 1.5 two logs above the minimal protective titers we're reaching at that point. Even the most important thing was that here it took 42 days to get to this point. Here by day seven, all 100% of the people are protected and they do are protected against all plates. Uh, so that was very interesting. But then the other interesting thing was that these people be vaccinated against clade zero, boosted with clade one, this is a response against clade one. What about all the other clades? Clade zero, clade two, 2.1, 2.3, all these kind of things. Well, this is it. Basically, we got complete coverage against all clades of H5 and one. So basically, that, uh, from my point of view, supports a, a solution where you vaccinate people anytime with, any, with an adjuvanted vaccine, with any uh, H5 and one vaccine, and then you wait, and what is a danger or a risk of a real pandemic, you can vaccinate them with one dose of another uh, vaccine, not necessarily the same, not necessarily the one causing the pandemic, and in less than seven days, everybody will be protected against any H5N1. And this obviously has, allows a lot of uh, flexibility in designing uh, solutions and stockpiling vaccines, all this, and solves all the problems that people say, which vaccine should be vaccinated? You don't care. I mean, as <clears throat> the, and I get you to the end. We are trying to understand also the immunology of these things. And interestingly enough, we find that the, basically the, the memory T cells which are induced after the first dose of the first vaccine are basically what trigger everything. And they generate memory B cells that are basically ready to go when you come here. And here you saw the memory B cells in the people have been primed with the adjuvant are much higher than the other. So not only we solve the problem, we also start to understand part of the human immunology, which has been part of the black box of uh, <coughs> how you do vaccines. So that's basically what I wanted to share with you today. And I uh, want to thank you for your attention and uh, be happy to uh, continue the discussion with you. So do we have some questions? Yes, David. We have a very nice talk, thank you. Um, one aspect of the, the idea of that we want risk-free vaccines <clears throat> is that uh, regulatory agencies, I don't yet have caught up to the value of adjuvants and the FDA in particular relative to CPG in the, in the Merck HPV vaccine and as well as Cervarex, which is licensed in Europe but not in the US. How, how do you see solving that particular perception problem and getting new adjuvants onto the market? Well, the, this is an important question. Obviously, the, 
while in Europe there have been two or three adjuvants that have been licensed the last few years, M59 was the first one 10 years ago. Uh, in the US, there is, I mean, the only licensed vaccines are based on alum, which is not even by, licensed by the FDA because we're licensed in the 20s before the FDA was installed. So the FDA has not licensed any adjuvant yet. Uh, however, the positive thing is last week at the, at the NIH, well, was a combined NIH FDA meeting on adjuvants where basically uh, we gave four talks on MF59, all these kind of things. And I think the FDA is seriously considering how to move forward. Obviously, they are very conservative and they will move uh, slowly. I believe the MF59, for which we have tremendous, we have 120 clinical trials done with this vaccine. And, and uh, 40 million doses given uh, to people. I think MA59 is likely to be the first one to get licensed in this country. And then as soon as they get confidence with that, they start the thing rolling. So I hope the next few months to get some positive results for, uh, for you, for us, and for uh, everybody in the vaccine area. Yes? heavy vaccination having an effect on our uh, selection for innate immunity? Uh, generations from now, what kind of immune system will our children's children's children have? Well, you, I don't know if I understand the question. You're asking whether, I mean, if we vaccinate, we is, somehow we, we may... Uh, How are preventing selection for Well, innate immunity is going to be there. It's not, uh, it's not adaptive, so it's not going to change if you vaccinate. Uh, the, I mean, <clears throat> there are a lot of people, I don't know if you, that's your question, say, well, you're giving too many antigens to people, to the kids, are we giving too many vaccines? The argument I have is that if, if, you, give, if you get one infection, one bacteria, you basically get hundreds of antigens. So, What's the problem if you get two or three with your vaccine? So I don't see any theoret theoretical limit to, to vaccination. I don't see any danger uh, to, to that. Uh, no, I don't. I don't see. I have a question that I think a lot of the students might be wondering about. It seems that you're always using new technology and new developments in, in the in the development of new vaccines. What areas of basic research could our students enter? that you think are really important for the next 10, 20, or beyond years? Well, for me, I mean, the, the gaps uh, in knowledge are in immunology, obviously. Uh, the structure of antigens. I mean, I haven't mentioned, but you know, when you look at viruses, people have been developing vaccines against many viruses. One, one that people have never been able to crack has been RSV, and there is a great medical need. And because people have been using conventional technologies, uh, purified the protein, the fusion protein, the envelope protein, and uh, in the case of RSV, it just didn't work. I mean, people purified this protein, this protein was changing overnight, it, couldn't, it was not stable, the next day it was not the same, and people didn't understand why. Today we know that mm, basically envelope proteins of virus are not just static proteins. They are proteins that have a pre-fusion status, then they change. If you change the pH, you change, they, become, they change into a totally different post-fusion status. And when people try to develop an RSV vaccine, they have no idea which one we're working with. And so that's why they never developed one. Today, I think you can engineer uh, the uh, subunit to be to remain to stick in the pre-fusion or post-fusion, you can really develop uh, a rational approach to vaccination, and that was not possible before. So I think understanding the structure to me is one of the most important things that we need to do in the next uh, the next decade. And now the high throughput structure uh, is becoming possible. So I think is uh, uh, I think we have a lot to learn from that. Okay, we're we're going to have to uh, take take. Uh, one more question in, in Carol. Um, so 
order to reduce prices of vaccines that are now sold in the developed world, in the developing world, or is it a new unit simply to bring resources and to invest in vaccines for diseases that only exist in the developing world? Well, is uh, more of the latter. Is uh, is basically is. Uh, it, this is a non-profit, it's not, it's not part of the vaccine company, it reports into global research, and legally is a different entity, but has access to all the technologies that we use for commercial vaccines. And the aim is basically to, to be able to spend resources to develop those vaccines for which there is no uh, economic incentive, there's no market. So ba basically nobody will ever invest on in those things. So th this institute focuses on the things where uh, that are only needed in developing countries. One last question. Showed that you showed that uh, you can uh, immunize people with uh, H5N3 mm -hmm. and within six years give them uh, another H5N1 vaccine and it's going to boost their response really fast. So do you have any idea about the rules that you can use for the first immunization? Does it, how similar it's supposed to be to the H5N1 or any other strain? When we <laughs> Uh, uh, I don't have, following this, we start another trial when we, we ask the questions, how long can we wait? You have to wait six years or two years are enough. Can you give one dose for primary or you need two? Uh, and which strains are you using? Preliminary data, which the trial is ongoing, uh, but the preliminary data basically say that uh, one dose is enough for priming, two are better, but one is enough. Uh, that doesn't really matter which one you use first, which one you use second. Uh, re really, uh, you, uh, you can use uh, two different, uh, as far as you use two different strains, doesn't really matter. So it's really very flexible schedule. It uh, uh, can allow you to basically stockpile after priming. You can stockpile any vaccine. And the day you have a danger or you want to vaccinate people, just give one dose and seven days will be protected. So it's very flexible. Anyway, uh, we're going to take a short break, and there's plenty of room for everybody. But uh, before we go out, I want to thank you, Reno, so much. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs>